The Atlantic Ocean is the second largest ocean, as I said, and um, it covers more than a quarter of the water surface of the Earth. Just to give you a flavor, the United States is less than a sixth of the size of the Atlantic Ocean in map view. And uh, the Atlantic Ocean is uh, very young. It only formed in the Jurassic period. This is when the dinosaurs went around. And the other oceans are all a lot older. So Jurassic was 180 to 150 million years. That's when the s ocean started to form. And it started to form from the breakup of a supercontinent, the supercontinent Pangaea. Pangaea means all Earth. And this goes back to this gentleman, Alfred Wegener. He was a geographer who realized that you could fit several of these continents together, like in a jigsaw puzzle. If you put South America next to Africa and move them together, they fit. And not only do the outlines fit, he also noted that several of the fossil groups fit. And this is what I'm showing here in the little diagram up there. We don't have to go into the details, but he realized that certain types of fossils, they go across these oceans. They can be found on either side of the Atlantic, and that meant they must have been connected at some point in the past. And he got a lot of criticism for that. People didn't want to believe this. He had no real mechanism to explain how continents would move. He called it continental drift. Today we call it plate tectonics. And um, by the time he, well, he actually died on expedition in Greenland. By the time he died, um, it was still not widely accepted. Only in the 1960s, when people realized that there's magnetic anomalies on the ocean floor that actually mark the changes of the ocean floor, did the theory get widely accepted. So, and here we see a little reconstruction in the central image of Pangaea, all the continents together back in the Jurassic era. And then on the right-hand side, we see a reconstruction through time. And here you see the opening of the Atlantic. It started in the south, and then it was like a sipper. It was unsipping towards the north, and then it spread in the north as well. So the ocean crust that formed as a result of the unsipping is a little older in the southern part of the Atlantic than it is in the northern part of the Atlantic. So, and there's various reconstructions out there today. And on the left-hand side, I'm showing one for Pangaea and the fate of the broken-up continent Pangaea. And in the right-hand image, you see the age of the oceanic crust that forms from the spreading. As soon as continents spread, mantle is upwelling and produces new oceanic crust that has a different composition than the continents, so it stays underwater and it's not floating like continents. And today we still have continental drift. The continents are still moving. The Atlantic is still spreading, but very slowly. It's spreading with about two centimeters a year. To give you a sense, this is about the speed with which your fingernails grow. The Pacific is a bigger and somewhat older ocean, and the Pacific spreads much faster. It spreads at seven to eight centimeters a year. Again, I'll give you an analogy. This is about the speed with which your hair grows. So you get a sense for the different things. Now, the Atlantic is spreading, the Pacific is spreading, both are spreading, and that means at some point we're running out of space. They're competing with each other. And I'll talk a little bit about that, because the Earth, of course, has a solution for that. So here we have the idea of spreading oceans. And the spreading ridge, the mid-Atlantic ridge, is exactly where the spreading manifests itself, the mid-oceanic ridge. This is where a lot of submarine volcanoes are located. And they are pushing material up and to the side. And whenever new rocks form at these submarine volcanoes, they actually inherit a certain magnetic signal at the time of formation. And this is what we see here. So if new volcanic rocks form, we impose a magnetic signal, and different times have different magmatic or magnetic signals, and therefore we get stripes, magnetic stripes on the ocean floor. And this allows us to work out the age of the ocean floor, and of course, those rocks that formed a long time ago, 
they tend to be further towards the margins, and those rocks that are forming later on or very young, they tend to be in the center near the ridge, the spreading ridge. So this is how we think it works at the moment with the spreading ridges, but of course, when you break up a big continent like Pangaea, you have to think about how that works. Well, we have good analogies here. For example, in East Africa, we have a rift zone, a continental rift zone, as we call it, in East Africa. The continents are breaking up. And we have this in Europe as well. The Rhine and Rhone graben is the same. And once we push this continental rift further apart, the sea creeps in. And our analogy for that is the Red Sea right now, the Red Sea rift. And eventually, once the continents have been pushed apart for considerable time, we have a real ocean like the Atlantic Ocean. So in the top right, you can anticipate these stages that we see in the various settings on Earth. And we believe that if a continental rift continues unhindered, eventually it'll make a big ocean. So where do we see these oceanic rifts? Well, there's very few places you can go them until, unless you go with a submersible all the way down to the ocean floor, but there's one exception, and that is Iceland. So I'll talk a little bit about Iceland. I had the pleasure of going to Iceland with Seaborn this summer, and uh, it was a spectacular experience, but this time of the year, it's not so nice up there. So uh, here, <laughs> So I recommend it for summer, that's what I'm really saying. <laughs> so Iceland, what is going on in Iceland? Well, Iceland sits right on this mid-Atlantic ridge. And we see this large fracture zone going all the way through Iceland here on the right-hand image. You can really see that the Earth crust is breaking apart in two slivers here. And in Iceland, you can actually hop from the American plate to the Eurasian plate or well, stand on both if you're lucky. So, and this is what we see there. But why do we see this only in Iceland? Well, the answer is Iceland is a bit peculiar. Iceland is two things together. It's a geological bundle. It is an Atlantic ridge coupled with a plume, a plume like Hawaii. And we have this stationary mantle plume, a hotspot as some people call it, rising up from depth and it happens to coincide with a ridge and therefore it pushes Iceland above the ocean and therefore we can see it. So we can actually walk in a mid-Atlantic ridge because there is an additional push from underneath the Iceland plume and this allows us to look at this in a lot of detail. So I'm going to spend a few minutes now in Iceland just to give you an impression of how we get our ideas about the ocean floor because Iceland has it above the surface. So here it is. So this is how the fracture zones in Iceland look like. And uh, the mid-ocean rift system here is above sea level because of the extra push. And once we have fractures going down to the ocean, they're going on to towards the sea level, like in the bottom right here, then the, indeed the ocean creeps in and you get the idea of how these things might look underwater. And very close to the coast, it looks like this. You can actually go bathe on the plate boundary between North America and Eurasia, and you can even dive down there. So this is still very shallow. It's just a few tens of meters, and there you can go there. You really see the fractures in the Earth crust, and you can dive down there. I've never done this myself. These are images I got from a friend, but apparently it's quite exciting. So the average depth of the Atlantic Ocean is about 3,300 meters, and um, it reaches its deepest point in um, the Puerto Rico, and um, there we usually have a somewhat elevated water depth at the mid-Atlantic ridge. So when we look at uh, this map here, sorry, we're up here. Iceland is just about here where the arrow is. So it's just off the map here. Here's the UK on the right. So if we look all the way down, the deepest parts of the Atlantic are actually in the margins. So I just told you the deepest area is here. But in the center at the ridge, we actually have an elevation and the little cartoon and the bottom left shows you this elevation. There is actually, as I said, a mountain chain. And the mountain chain is heavily fractured. It comes down 
north to south, but also it has these perpendicular fractures that cut across the ridge. We call them transform faults. And when I was a young PhD student, I had the pleasure to sail on a few research ships, and here's a few of them, the Meteor and the Poseidon, and just to make you feel a little better, I put some of the bad weather shots in the top right. So uh, I tell you, the Sojourn is a lovely ship, <laughs> even in bad weather. <laughs> these research ships are not quite built in the same way. So, and uh, with these, you can actually dredge rocks from the ocean floor. Dredge means you have these large steel buckets and they're thrown overboard and they are scraping rocks from the ocean floor and then they're pulled up and you get actually samples from there. There's usually also submersibles, but they're very expensive, so people don't like to use them too frequently. But in certain kind of areas, this works rather well. But imagine the stress as a scientist if you are responsible for one of those dredges or one of those submersibles. You're sitting there at this computer screen, you're worried that this thing might come back, and I've seen some of them being lost, some of the dredges. The financial burden is enormous, and the mood on the ship is really bad for a few days afterwards, I tell you. So, but luckily, we can retrieve a lot of samples, and uh, we can work with them. So this is where we get a pretty good idea. And as I said, we have a lot of this fissure volcanism that happens underwater. And this is an image of the Iceland eruption just from last year. And at the very initial stage of the Iceland eruption, you can actually see the fissure here. So let me just zoom in here a little bit. So see that this is a fracture that opened up, and uh, this fracture is feeding lava to the surface. And underwater, the lava fountains are not as spectacular because there's a lot of water pressure, but the fractures are almost identical. We have these fractures, and lava is oozing out along those fractures. So we have a magma reservoir that sits under the, the ocean ridge, and it's actually a very elongate magma reservoir. We like to think it's kind of cigar-shaped and then slightly offset, followed by another cigar. And this way, we have likely magma under most of the ocean ridges of the world. And we have about 60,000 kilometers of ocean ridges all over the globe, not just in the Atlantic. So there's a lot of magma. In fact, 85% of volcanism on this planet is submarine. We don't see it. What we see is only a tiny fraction at the surface. So here, this is how it manifests itself. And here we have a little bit of uh, magma or lava tube forming. And there's a submersible observing this. That's the technical things in the bottom of the image. And very close to them, we have these um, black and white smokers. I'll talk a little bit more about them. Of course, this is not smoke. This is actually minerals that precipitate from hot solutions that are expelled from the ocean crust. So when the hot solutions come out, then they meet the cold ocean water, and then there gets a chemical reaction that leads to mineral precipitation. But I'll talk a little bit more about this towards the end. So here's a lot of impressions from how it looks underneath our feet. And uh, there we have what we call pillow lavas. These are well, pillow-shaped lava uh, portions. And then we have also ropey lava and lava flows, as we've seen in the Canaries, in fact. The pillows form because lava often quenches against the cold ocean water. And then we continue the flow inside these tubes. And therefore, they stay a little hotter inside than on the outside. And that actually insulates the lava. So we get these pillow features rather frequently. Here's a few more impressions of pillow lavas on the ocean floor. Every now and then they break out and they form little lava tongs, as for example in the bottom right-hand side. And uh, this is a very characteristic feature of these pillows that every geology student learns rather swiftly. If you see lavas like this, you know they formed underwater. So here's a few more impressions. And there is actually the arm of one of these submersibles that is taking a sample here. 
it's quite a sophisticated procedure to operate the arm and get the sample and retrieve the sample. So these are horribly expensive rocks by the time they enter the laboratories of this world, uh, of our kind of universities and research centers. And uh, yes, it's just a lump of volcanic rock. Technically, it has no value, but the amount of effort and resources that went in to retrieve them is quite spectacular. So here's a few more impressions and um, a few more of these pillow lavas. And of course, once there's no new eruptions, all sorts of um, life to starts to take shape and form. And here, for example, we have various types of mollusks, shells, and uh, mussels that start to colonize the areas. And with time, of course, there will be sediment on top as well, and eventually there is life on the ocean floor that recolonizes all these fresh volcanic rocks. Every now and then, we find something spectacular when the first submersibles went down into the rich crest. They found these strange pillars and the roof over the pillars. And this was really puzzling for some time. But then we observed a submarine eruption. And this phenomenon is a bit like lava tubes. So we have lava that is expelled in the graben, in the, in the depression on the ridge. And sometimes the lava drains out. But certain pillars may remain, particularly when we had some water involved. And uh, then we actually get these hollow areas. And sooner or later, they collapse. And the specimen I'm showing on the bottom right is actually from the bottom. It's not the surface. It's looking from underneath. And you see how these uh, roof crusts were pushed up and that the lava that was still liquid was, was getting thinner and thinner and being stretched out. So this is a wonderful specimen explaining the process of how these empty spaces can form even at the ocean floor. But they are metastable. Sooner or later, they will usually collapse. So I talked about smokers before that are actually not smoking. Uh, they are expelling hot liquids, and uh, they built these chimneys. And uh, this is a rather bizarre landscape. And I'll come back to this a little later, because these chimneys are actually very, very useful for resources. And they bring a lot of metals up from the ocean floor. But they are also the places of very simple, primitive bacteria living there. So a lot of what we call archaeobacteria, these actually single-celled organisms, they're not really bacteria. They just have the name bacteria for a lack of better understanding at the time when they were discovered. They live in these hot spring environments on the ocean floor. And there is speculation that they could have even been the place where life originated. So here's a few impressions, and there is uh, an artist's drawing of how some of these single-celled archaeobacteria might actually look like. And they start to, well, enjoy the time there. They like the heat. They like the strange pH conditions. It's very acidic there. And they're really well adapted to these conditions. These are environments we would not survive in. But life has found a way to thrive even in those places. <laughs> 